Good morning, everybody. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. And to begin, I'll remind everybody of a few logistics. The meeting is being recorded, and as soon as possible, we'll post the audio to the district's Office of Open Government website. During the meeting, I'd ask all the advisory group members and their guests to mute themselves unless they wish to speak. Uh, members of the public may listen in today, but there's no scheduled time for public comment at this meeting. Um, we, I guess I'll go ahead and go through and do a roll call. First of uh, advisory group members, uh, do we have Don Brayman? Here. Great. And Paul Butler? We don't see Paul on our list. Uh, Renata Cooper, I don't think I see Renata on our list. Helder Gill, I also don't see Helder on the list. Um, Laura Hankins. I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> here. <laughs> Great, uh, Dave Rosenthal. And again, uh, I see we have some callers in the in the public line. Dave, if that if you happen to be in there, um, ah, okay, and it does seem Dave is in there. Um, um this is Seema. Uh, it yes. sounds like Dave is actually having trouble getting online. Yeah, it seems he kind of went in through the public line. So I'm going to. Um, uh, unmute one of the public call-in numbers. Uh, Dave, is that you? Can you now speak? All right, I think that was not Dave. We'll try uh, one of the other here numbers and see. Dave, can can you uh, speak? Can you hear me now? Oh, this is Paul Butler. I'm on the public line. Great. Okay. So, uh, excellent. Thank you, Paul. I'm gonna. Uh, See if I can move you into the panelist uh, line, and if not, I will just keep you open and unmuted. Um, let's see. All right. Um, well, Paul, I'll, I'll, I'll just keep, I think it, sometimes it's a little unusual on these people coming on themselves. So I will keep going muted, certainly on my end. Um, so that, okay. uh, yeah, um, and I assume you can mute on your end if you wish to, but. Um, yeah, that's fine. I'll great. Do that. Great. And the other, uh, again, I don't seem to be able to get um, Dave, I, I do think. Um, uh if yeah there's just no way for me to identify him otherwise so if he wants to try again via the um the link that was sent out that would be great uh again apologies for any uh logistics confusion uh hopefully everybody got uh, an automated email though for um all the panelists uh all their advisor group members so please use that if you if you can um, uh, let me go through kind of other roll call, other folks here. Uh, do we have, I believe we have Seema, is that true? Seema Kejwani. Yeah, I'm on. This is Seema. Great. And uh, do we have uh, Nishant Kirkat? I don't see um, Nishant. Uh, Katya, Katya Seminova. I'm here. Great. Um, Ilana Suttenberg. Here. Great. Um, and we also have, besides myself, Richard Schmeckel, other CCRC staff, Ginu Park, Rachel Redfern, and Patrice Sultan. Um, all right. Um, again, apologies to. Uh, Give me just a few seconds here. Let me uh, try to message Dave with. Um...
Hi, this is Dave joining. Oh, great, excellent. Um, was just trying to get you on there, Dave. Uh, glad we figured that out. Well, uh, what I actually did was log in with SEMA. Oh, well, great. <laughs> Do we have two SEMAs then? I, I don't I'm, know. Um, I'm still on, and David says your name. Perfect. Yeah, no, I know, All right. my computer's to my name. I think when you sent that updated message, it updated my thing to your email, but it doesn't matter. I'm on now. All right. Uh, very good. Well, uh, Dave, thank you. We have uh, with us uh, Don and Paul and Laura and uh, Kevin Whitfield and uh, Seema and Katya and Ilana and CCRC staff. All right. Um, <laughs> Well, it takes a while to get going here. Uh, it may end up being a short meeting after all. I only have two announcements uh, to kind of make before we uh, see if there are any questions about the draft reports. Uh, first, I wanted to remind everyone that written comments on the draft reports are due November 9th, uh, about a month away now. Uh, that deadline was set so that we on the staff side have time to address that before we issue our of across the board comprehensive update uh, in December. Uh, not sure yet exactly when it is. We hope sooner than later, uh, but uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of matters to address. So <laughs> we're doing our <coughs> we're doing our best. Um, second, um, tomorrow I will send out to the advisory group. <coughs> an updated compilation uh, of our statutory language to date. The version that was sent out on um, September 28th uh, with the current draft reports uh, inadvertently left out the definition of deadly force um, from section 707, 701, excuse me, where we went to, meant to put it. Uh, we did put the definition in report 67, but in the compilation that just didn't get in. And so um, uh, the update will correct that error and I'll send that out tomorrow uh, along with the minutes of this meeting. Um, that's it for announcements right now. Um, so let me kind of jump straight into the agenda items for discussion and first uh, kind of maybe do two groupings here and checking in uh, on Reports 63 to 65, uh, this is misrepresentation of a District of Columbia entity allowing dogs to go at large and contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Um, any, any questions or discussion uh, folks want to have on those uh, draft reports uh, here at the meeting? I, I have a couple of questions or comments on 63 and 64. Uh, if you want to start there. You bet. Go ahead, Dave. All right. The first one, and these are sort of just preliminary. I, you know, it's sort of like first impression, not necessarily how OAG is going to come down. But on 63, it says, with intent to receive a personal or business benefit event, with intent to receive a personal or business benefit of any kind. Um, I noticed that, you know, there were comments and we made changes, I think it was prostitution and maybe some other ones where we recognize that the person doing it may not get a personal benefit, but someone else may. And so just to let you know what I was thinking was updating that to say perhaps with intent that anyone receive a personal or business benefit of any kind. So I just wanted to start with that to get people's reactions. Sure. Um, just open it up to anybody if you have uh, questions or concerns. I mean, uh, to follow up on that, again, this <laughs> the statute's a, a very kind of uh, narrow targeted statute, uh, rarely, rarely prosecuted. And it is aimed at collection agencies and those who kind of misrepresent themselves as uh, somehow having a kind of district authority 
uh, as a private investigator. So um, it, it, it's kind of a narrow targeted uh, at those businesses and persons engaging in those practices. Um, no, I agree. Yeah. And the yeah, hypothesis yeah. I was thinking was somebody's not paying me rent. So I get my brother-in-law to go over there and mm -hmm. make like he's a cop or whatever. Mm -hmm. Then he is not getting a personal or business benefit of any kind, but I am. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, again, you don't need to necessarily, I mean, that sort of thought process that I had in the hypo I was thinking of, and I think sure. it fits in this. So again, I'm not sure if we'll put it in, but if we do, I just wanted to give you a heads up. Sure. Um, right. I think depending on the fact pattern, you know, accomplice liability uh, may be there. Uh, committing crime by an innocence is another possibility, depending on kind of how, uh, again, the person uh, is orchestrating this and the uh, mental state of the, um, the person who's engaged in the conduct. Um, but yes, certainly open to your point too that it needs to be uh, clear that this that in terms of the benefit prong. Um, now, uh, you know, honestly, uh, again, this was kind of modeled after some other uh, of the fraud language we have elsewhere, and it is a fairly, um, you know, it's meant to be construed very broadly, this provision about receiving a personal or business benefit. Um, it may even be so broad as to be uh, not useful. <laughs> um, uh, so an, another option that, you know, you might consider in your comments um, is, is, you know, possibly eliminating uh, that uh, subsection. Um, it's, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I think that the 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 key the key there is the intent to deceive. Um, uh, that is kind of what puts this in the land of fraudulent activity, and um, aligns this with other kind of our, our fraud statutes. So that's that's the more fundamental uh, or or you know most important element. Um, well, Wait, that's the uh, element I wanted to talk about. The, the deception. Yes, oh, I was great. troubled by the lawful authority phrase. Hmm. Um, so I thought of an example. Um, somebody has a debt collection business, not somebody, um, you know, Don Collins or whatever, right, has a debt collection business. Uh, and sometimes it's written Don Collins Debt Collectors, and sometimes it's written DC DC, and sometimes it's written DC Debt Collectors. But it's his initials. But it, I, I assume, I mean, maybe it's not debt. I mean, you know, it's so you have to have a business license in DC. I'm troubled by lawful authority being broad and not being about an intent to deceive someone as to their, as to being or representing themselves to be the District of Columbia, right? So the deception might be something else. And in fact, someone might get confused, but the intent isn't to confuse people about whether they're the District of Columbia. And then I didn't see anything in the commentary that made me feel better about the phrase lawful authority. I don't know if it's used somewhere else, and so then somewhere else it's more, it's narrow, and this will get interpreted in a more narrow way, but it troubled me. Um, sure, uh, that's, a, a, I think, a reasonable um, concern. It certainly, I don't think there was any intent, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, our intent on the drafting there was- There was a was, reckless disregard. There we go. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I'm not sure we were really aware of that risk that would be misinterpreted this way, but um, it might have been negligent. Um, uh, no, we, yes, connecting that uh, element um, more closely with the nature of, um, uh, you know, the goal here of misrepresenting. Lawful authority as a District of Columbia entity or representative 
uh, we could uh, try to tighten up the drafting so that it that phrase about the deception more clearly links uh, what is it about their authority? It's about their authority uh, deceiving as to their authority as a District of Columbia entity or government entity or representative. Would that address your concern? Am I understanding you correctly? Yes, I believe it would. Great. Okay. We will definitely uh, look at that, but certainly would be happy to have that in written comments as well. Um, other questions or points on this report? Yeah, I've got another one. Sure. Um, um, the, you know, the, it eliminates the emblem or insignia language. And I, I just wanted to spend a minute probing it because I could remember about a dozen or so years ago, maybe, maybe 20 years ago now, that there were a bunch of, there were people selling badges that looked just like MPD's badge because it said Metropolitan Police on the top over the Capitol building, I think it was, or the, whichever building that is on their thing, but it didn't have DC on. And so the, so, you know, the question comes up, if we remove emblem from this and somebody shows up who's a debt collector and flashes a badge that says uh, police on it, but does not say DC on it. So it doesn't fit into, uh, un, you know, removing the, the phrase emblem or insignia from this provision, I would imagine them flashing that fake badge would not be a violation of the statute, even though they were doing it to deceive someone into paying a debt. Um, I think the, the answer is that yes, both under the current 2234.01, the current statute and under the revised statute, if the emblem does not include the words, you know, District of Columbia, District or DC, uh, uh, that is not put it within the scope of this statute. Now, again, there may be broader, um, you know, this is a very targeted specific statute tailored to certain kind of almost, almost regulatory, uh, you know, provisions, but uh, broader fraud liability may apply. Um, depending on what the, you know, what they're trying I mean, to do. So my question would be, what would that specific base? You have every other element of this offense by a debt collector who yep. flashes a fake DC police badge that merely, yep. that merely doesn't have DC on it, but otherwise fits into the specific terms of this offense. And so the question would be, what would be that charge? And what, because I, Quite off the top of my head, I again, I didn't do a lot of research. I said this preliminary. I didn't see what it was, but I don't see why it should be excluded. Because whether you say I represent DC or it's on your district or it's on your business card, is it being on a badge? Why that should make a difference, as you say, to this targeted offense. So in any event, I'll give you a heads up on that. You don't necessarily have to answer it now. Sure. I well, I you know, I I, I think the the question uh, to think about is, again, you know, this this is not meant to be the sole um, uh, way that, um, you know, fraudulent or deceptive activity in this area is controlled. There is broader fraud liability if it's, you know, to deprive the an owner of property or, um, property, you know, again, per our definition, so broad as to include, you know, services and labor. Um, so there may be broader liability, but, you know, if, if OAG wants to recommend expanding the scope of the law, um, in this case, that's, you know, <laughs> certainly open to that, but, but that isn't where the current statute is, right? The current statute requires the uh, insignia to uh, pull up the exact language here. Uh, but it refers to any emblem or insignia utilizing any of the said terms as part of its design. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so no, I, I agree. It, it would be slightly broader than what is in current law. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, look, this is, this is limited in other ways too, right? You know, it's about uh, particularly focused on writing, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, 
that you know you could certainly make the argument too that it is deceptive to merely say um, that again one is representing the district flashes a badge of any sort that you know looks official but doesn't actually say dc or district um and i think you know this is just kind of one level of uh violation uh yeah so i i uh okay. if you want to recommend yeah expansion of of kind of you know current law uh, for this uh, revised offense uh definitely look at that um all right, that's all I got on 63. I have a couple of comments on 64, but I'm done with 63. Great. A anything more on uh, 63 from anybody else? All right. If not, let's let's go ahead and move on to 64. Uh, David, I know you said you had something here. Yeah, a couple of things. One is um, I had the criminal section look up dogs at large at least the DC code provision about it. And it, and and I think it is in the last, I don't know, eight years, 10 years, it's probably, there have probably only been about a dozen arrests for it, only one of which ended up going to trial. So I, I sort of, in general, my thought is that, that the recommendation makes sense Again, I have to review it in more detail uh, and double check the regs that were cited. So getting that part out of, out of the way, the only part that I thought uh, needed, needed more consideration is, is 22.13.11 has a, another provision that I don't believe the regulations have, and that is the authorization of the pound master uh, and I'm sure that term can be updated to um, to euthanize the uh, a dangerous animal, and I don't believe that's in the regulations. And if it's not, I think we uh, we may need to make a recommendation to add that authority back in. Um, sure. Um, my recollection um, and. Uh, is that there are some provisions in uh, DCMR uh, for um, euthanization in certain cases, um, but um, we can certainly double check that as well. Um, again, you know, the, the sense was overall this is largely duplicative of uh, and, and less uh, detailed and less updated, frankly, than the DCMR provisions. Yeah, that's why I said, yeah. I said at the beginning, I, you know, that wasn't the concern. I, I wanted to, you know, I, I, my general point is I'm, I'm not disputing that. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that the authority for the other part of it is there because that's tacked into 20 to 13 11. I'll check the DCMR as well. Sure. Um, uh sure um any other questions on this report from others on report 64. um all right um report 65 uh any questions at this point and and, and i should mention too that you know we uh, you know, the timing always varies a bit, but um, we will have a our November <coughs> uh, advisory group meeting <coughs> day after the election. So um, we will have a chance then before uh, written comments are due to uh, address any additional questions. Um, if, if you don't have any today or we need to have further discussion. But um, right. Any anything at this point on um, report 65? So, so, so I just started reading yesterday and I haven't gotten all the way through this, so maybe it's answered somewhere, but, but I'm, I'm curious about contributing to chronic truancy. Yeah. Where chronic truancy means being subject to compulsory school attendance and being absent from school without a legitimate excuse for 10 or more full days within a single school year. 
when am I contributing to chronic truancy? The first day or the 11th day? And I'm like, oh, come on, let's just go hang out. Yep. Um, that, um, <laughs> that point has occurred to us. Um, I'm, the 11th day, right? The 11th day is what we, um, uh, you know, intended. I don't recall, and Rachel, if you want to come on, and I don't remember if there is a specific, we addressed that in the commentary. I, I will say, um, uh, you know, look, we are trying to provide a level of detail uh, to this, which is totally absent, right, you know, from the current statute. Um, which doesn't uh, really provide any uh, basis for uh, assessing what level of uh, truancy, um, you know, it, the current statute just refers be true, um, a part day, an hour, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, maybe it's to be construed that broadly, maybe it isn't elsewhere again, uh, reporting guidelines have kind of changed uh, recent years for how this is handled. Um, so we tried to find a reasonable line for more uh, serious chronic level conduct. Um, and coupled with the mental state in the uh, revised statute, right, um, it um, definitely is more onerous I think than, than the plain language of the current statute um, in terms of requiring uh, the um, actor to uh, you know really be aware that this is a, a, a situation of chronic truancy. But Rachel, do you want to chime in? Is there is there anything more already there in the commentary to kind of uh, address mm -hmm. this point? I think we could make it probably we could. Our intent was to have it be on the 11th day or the um, if the defendant satisfies the the mental state that yes, that would in fact be chronic truancy. We would we could make it um, clear in the commentary and make sure that the statutory language precludes an interpretation where like on day five, I say, hey, come and hang out. And then a week later, mm -hmm. oh, look, you hit 10 days of absence. I don't think that would work with the mental state requirement. But long story short, we can go back and just make sure the commentary is clear and that the statutory language um, as best it can does not uh, include anything up to that 10th day. Unless you are the person that pushes the child over into the 11th day and you know it. But yeah, Laura's hypo we did not intend to include. Thank you. Silana, I also had a question, and I'll just start by saying that I know absolutely nothing about the contributing to delinquency of a minor under current law. Um, what, and I recognize this is in current law, but what does it mean that there's an exclusion if the, uh, if the conduct constitutes an act of civil disobedience? What does that <laughs> encompass? Is there any case law on this? I mean, I, I can imagine kind of a Greta Thunberg situation of like, you know, striking every Friday for climate change or something like that, maybe not chronic truancy, but like if you're, I, I don't know, like I'm sure, I'm sure you've thought about this. So any guidance on what that means would be helpful. Um, you, you, you guys are uh, very good at what you do. Um, you, <laughs> the, this, this is another little sticky point. Um, and I, I think it's safe to say that we agree it is not clear um, th that term which we bring over from current law, um, uh, how that is to be determined. Um, it seems like, you know, clearly there are forms of political speech that would uh, more clearly fall into that. And then uh, beyond that, uh, we don't, uh, yes, we, 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 we uh, don't have any kind of opinion. I don't believe there's, you know, there's practically no case law uh, on this offense at all, let alone this uh, point. I think, um, yeah, I, I, I don't have anything more to say about that. I, uh, from our read of the legislative history, there isn't anything to clarify this point either as to what was kind of initially intended, other than it seems like a recognition that Right. Um, 
exercise of First Amendment rights uh, is a valid basis. Can I ask but, a question, Richard, that maybe is would be considered an act of civil disobedience? I don't know. And this maybe this also sort of ties in into the fact that that this doesn't merge with anything. So I was about to say I just finished reading, but I think that's not true. I think I just finished listening to um, educated. I know everybody else read it years ago. Um, um, right about this woman who who was raised by survivalist sort of um, very strict Mormon um, parents, um, not not and as she makes the point in the beginning, sort of not not to to single out Mormonism, but but you can imagine someone for religious reasons or for some other reasons saying, I don't believe in sending my kids to school. We have neglect provisions for that. It strikes me that that's probably also contributing to the delinquency of a minor, but I'm doing it because I don't believe the government has any business in my family life. Um, and I really am objecting to um, to the compulsory education statutes. Uh, that strikes me as an act of civil disobedience. I It concerns me just as a general matter that when I am neglecting my kid, my, engaging in educational neglect and just saying to my kid, ah, whatever, it's just not that big of a deal. You don't need to go today. Um, that I am that I am guilty of both things. So the merger thing concerns me. But is that is at least on the civil disobedience front? Does that does that is that maybe an example? Um, Richard, I uh, hear. Um, I don't think those are my children in the background um, at present. Um, uh, so yes, I think that could be an it. Certainly, a, a a reasonable hypothetical um, for which perhaps a civil disobedience um, uh, exception could be raised. However, um, you know, obviously the you know the district as well as you know other jurisdictions provide for uh, you know uh, a mechanism for opting out of. Uh, public schooling and uh, you know so uh, merely mere non-attendance and uh, failure to kind of provide notice to I don't know if it's Aussie or you know wh whoever it is um, the some of the some of the guidance again that's been issued as to what constitutes chronic truancy um, kind of does link up with this so um, uh, you know I, I think um, uh, you know, the the language as we've defined chronic truancy, you know, goes to the legitimate excuse. Um, the legitimate excuse, we could more clearly kind of link to the kind of recognized exceptions for, you know, um, again, parents who choose not to send their kids to public schools. There are many legitimate excuses for non-attendance. Um, we could try to more clearly link that. Um, if that would be helpful, but uh, yeah, I, your fact pattern remains that there might be instances where refusal to have your child attend school is an act of civil disobedience, understood as again a form of political speech or protest. Um, but we don't have more. Uh, you know, I, 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 yeah. Go ahead, Rachel. I just wanted to add too is a that that kind of uh, hypothetical would probably also fall underneath the affirmative defense that we have put in the statute. Um, which is not in the current contributing statute, but we added where a, a person in that situation might be arguing that they are intending to safeguard or promote the welfare of the complainant, because I don't think my child should be in public school, et cetera. And it seems as though there would not be a substantial risk of or causing death or serious bodily injury, and a fact finder would determine if that's reasonable or not. So it seems as though there would be another possible um, way our statute uh, could address that. And, and this, Dave, just if you're going to try to harmonize this, um, the, I believe it's got to be consistent with the attendance laws. And my understanding of those require, it doesn't, it doesn't say you have to send your kid to a school building. It has a provision for uh, homeschooling. And so the question would be, 
is and, and I don't know the article Laura was referring to, but does it mean that the child was never schooled at all, not even homeschooled, or or were they simply not going to school? Because you know, it may be civil disobedience not to send your kid to school because you don't believe in what the school's teaching, but then under DC attendance laws, you need to homeschool the child. And so, you know, some I don't know exactly how how this would all fit together. This is Ilana. It seems to me that a lot of this kind of civil disobedience exception, we're kind of talking in the context of what's been drafted a second degree that really has more to do with the tru truancy, um, possibly a court order. But I am struggling to see how it would apply to first degree where you're really talking about crimes being involved, because if it is in fact a crime, um, presumably you know that there's no, um, it, I, I don't, see how it could be an exception to have civil disobedience if it is also at the same entry. time being found to be a crime. Why not unlawful entry? What do you mean? That's a crime. Why isn't that why isn't that potentially an act of civil disobedience? Right? You can sort of imagine a I don't know, a sitting at a lunch counter perhaps being an act of civil disobedience. Thank you to the White House. Entry, but 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 um, and and encouraging as as was done and is still done, encouraging young people to engage in similar behavior. But why would it be a defense only as relates to the minor and not in general? Like it, it just seems like a strange dichotomy. And I, I know your response will probably be, well, it should be a defense for everything. <laughs> um, uh, but it just seems like a dichotomy that we're creating. And I was just trying to understand that a little bit better. Wait, but I don't. Uh, it's a defense to this particular event. I don't understand. I don't understand what you mean a dichotomy. Like an adult would not have that same civil disobedience exclusion for unlawful entry. But an adult telling a child to do it would have the exclusion. The child might not have, has or does not have the the defense, right? This isn't a delinquency offense. Right. This is not charging the adult with both unlawful entry and contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Because when they said, hey, this is a really important <laughs> issue. Let's go sit in at, you know, the mayor's office on the issue of her behavior with respect to blah, blah, I have no idea. Sure, and I, and I, and my question is just that it kind of seems that if we're going to, I'm not trying to undermine probably whatever broader point I might want to try to make, but if we're going to have an exclusion for telling a minor to do this, why would that same exclusion not exist for the person doing it themselves? That's the kind of dichotomy that I'm talking about. Does that make sense? me it's a, um, a, well I uh, this is Richard let me let me interject and say you know to uh, uh, recommend a broader First Amendment exception to uh, you know trespass and other uh, offenses I, you know obviously we could have that conversation I, I don't think that's you know um, uh, Right. I, I mean, I, I hear you a lot of that, 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 like, you know, this is a kind of a different treatment here for this kind of a, what is what is an unusual offense, right, um, uh, of the person in charge of their, you know, uh, minor kind of al allowing or encouraging um, uh, this behavior. Um, but it still remains that, right, that's teenager and that parent, if they go to the protest, um, they sit in, they are arrested for trespassing, they will face trespass charges. It's just that um, this wouldn't be on top of it. Um, and, you know, I, I, I I don't know a way to kind of more uniformly treat this. Certainly, uh, if First Amendment issues arise in other contexts for other offenses, um, you know, we've tried to address that in some offenses where it, it's particularly uh, and more more likely to occur, but um, I don't think we want to do that for kind of core trespass um, 
uh, which, you know, is very common, obviously, you know, uh, political speech related offense. Um, so I don't know that, uh, you know, if, if you want to pitch uh, the changes to other offenses to also reflect this or don't or think there shouldn't be an exception here, um, uh, you know, please, please do add that, you know, to your comments. I, I um, again, we, we didn't find in legislative history um, any kind of more discussion of this particular point. Um, and in general, um, you know, I think Laura kind of opened up with this too, which is to say, um, you know, parents who are encouraging what might be other, you know, criminal behavior, um, right, uh, uh, do, you know, they have liability in other uh, ways for abuse of a minor or neglect of a minor, um, uh, depending on how all that plays out, um, committing crime by an innocent, um, depending on how the facts so, um, you know, we still plenty of liability. This, the whole purpose, I think, of this offense is really to add a uh, relatively, relatively small but significant uh, bump, right? It's, it's building, at least in the first degree, it's just uh, predicated on already meeting kind of the, the elements for this other offense and, and encouraging it. So, uh, it's not a standalone offense. You know, the only place it's it's kind of doing really unique um, work covering distinctive conduct is in the second degree. Um, so 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 yeah. I mean, we we've <laughs> I don't know if there's more to, more to say on that point. Um, anybody else want to chime in on the civil disobedience language or or kind of how that plays out here and in whether it should be included in other offenses? This is Paul. Can you hear me? Yes, we we can hear you, Paul. Yeah, I, I don't have any any um, specific comment on the civil disobedience. I I do just want to put on the record my own opinion that this is a a dumb crime. Obviously, anybody who is has a child who isn't going to school, and the child the parent knows about that, and for whatever reason is tolerating it. The problem the parent has issues that I think are not best resolved by the criminal legal process. And we know that women are much more likely to be charged with this crime than men are, even though most children or many children have parents who are both men and women. So I just wanted to put that on the record since it came up what the purpose of this crime is. Again, there's no evidence that these kinds of laws work to help kids get back in school. Thank you, Paul. Um, and Yes, sir. are there other are other follow ups about? That? Yeah, I, 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 I agree with Paul. I, I also want to want to say with respect to what you just what you said before, um, Richard, before Paul spoke, was this something about this isn't a standalone crime or something? So again, I'm troubled by the fact that it doesn't merge with anything. And I'm yeah. wondering how in, in particular um, uh, with respect to our, our abuse, criminal abuse statute or whatever we ended up calling it. And I, I, I haven't looked, but I'm, I'm curious how much harmonizing was done and why this wouldn't for someone who could be held responsible for neglect, which is not every adult in the world, um, but is someone with a particular relationship to the child, why why don't these merge? Why why don't at least those offenses merge? Um, it's a fair question. I think I think the hardest one is uh, neglect, right? Because um, we have uh, uh, framed those offenses in terms of, again, being kind of unique to persons with authority over um, the minor. Um, and uh, so, so we, it, it's a fair point as, as to those particular offenses. I think, um, and so we can definitely look at that again in terms of merger. That for every other offense, 
I think the, the concern is that while normal kind of accomplice or solicitation liability that may attach um, with regard to any person, you know, soliciting or being an accomplice to another person committing a crime, uh, there is a particular um, harm and a more egregious harm when that person who's the accomplice or soliciting it is the uh, caretaker. And so that's where this comes in. And I think uh, broadly, we do kind of want to uh, go beyond what is, again, kind of normal accomplice solicitation liability. But I hear your point and um, we can definitely examine again whether it should merge with um, only with that it should merge with uh, neglect or abuse of a minor, uh, but uh, not merge with other offenses. Again, abuse and neglect of a minor are, are kind of uniquely also like this, uh, <laughs> uh, tailored to um, persons who have authority over the minor. So in that sense, these two are both uh, providing a bump right for conduct where it's not just an assault it's not just you know whatever it is uh property damage theft uh it is a misuse of that adult's um authority over the minor so both those two statutes but really only those two kind of get at this but maybe uh you're right and and that should merge um are there other thoughts on that kind of merger point with uh, abuse of a minor and neglect of a minor. Otherwise, uh, you know, we'll, we can definitely look at that and would encourage everybody if they wish to chime in on written comments on that point, because we'll definitely look at this as to the merger provision. I have a different question on the merger. I don't mean to interrupt that. Great. Um, one thing that I was just thinking about, um, I, I, I believe this has been drafted. I remember seeing this, um, that if you're under 14, there's no culpability, right? Um, if you contribute to the delinquency of a 13 year old, that doesn't, I don't think that would constitute a district offense because the minor can't have that level of culpability. So it seems like you could basically only contribute to the delinquency of a minor when they're 14 or older. Am I getting that right? Um, no, no, um, not quite. Um, so a couple things. So uh, we have a defense uh, based on age. Um, 12 is the cutoff. If you're under 12, um, uh, the defense, um, but it is styled as a defense, right? <clears throat> so unlike a jurisdictional provision, which would kind of categorically, uh, you know, remove authority for, you know, from OIG for delinquency proceedings, you know, styling it as a defense to an offense um, still, I think, keeps this in play. The fact that the minor themselves may not be liable, we've kind of specifically addressed in subsection D here um, of the contributing statute saying that, you know, an actor be, can be convicted of this, even though there aren't delinquency proceedings, right? So um, uh, I, I think- And I kind of took that to mean like, even though in fact, maybe delinquency proceedings may not have been filed, perhaps it just wasn't appropriate to charge the child, but it would still have to be a legally appropriate that you could have charged the child, even if they chose not to. That is-, that is I'm not sure why the linkage is that you can't um, you can't encourage your, your child to do something that's horrendous, that's a crime, even though the kid themselves may not have. You know, it's almost like the innocent stuff that uh, you know the innocent uh, defending kind of stuff we work on. Why why does it need to be linked to the prosecution of the child? Uh, you could have you. I could think of situations where you would never prosecute a child, uh, e even whether the defense applies or not, uh, because of the ignorance or innocence of the child. But yet, it, it would be wrong for the parent uh, to to try to get the child to break those laws. 
Right. I, I and, and I think I suspect we're all on the same page here, <clears throat> which is to say, or <laughs> Alana and Dave and, and I might be at least on this point, which is we intended this to uh, 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 not be uh, barred if the uh, person under 18 is a seven-year-old, right? Like um, who, uh, or a five-year-old, let's say, right? Who neither, you know, nobody, nobody's going to bring proceedings against and uh, uh, practically speaking, and there's a defense available if there were, uh, you know, uh, delinquency proceedings, but, um, Regardless, our intent was that this uh, contributing to the negligence uh, uh, delinquency of a minor statute, the parent could still have liability. Our only point, in, our very point of subsection D um, in the contributing was to uh, try to uh, clarify in the statute that that right, it, it, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, you know whether what other proceedings delinquency proceedings may have may have happened or um, whether anything was brought. So we intended to get there. Now, maybe the statutory language in D isn't clear enough. Um, uh, we um, uh, tried to uh, follow uh, some of the provisions in current law, uh, you know, um, yeah, um, I'm trying to, so under current, the current statute, um, there's a provision, um, let's see if I can find it, that's kind of comparable, that says, um, it's not a defense to prosecution under, under this section that the minor does not engage in, is not charged with, is not adjudicated delinquent for, or is not convicted as an adult for any uh, conduct set forth in kind of the A1 through 7, the, the, the predicates of, you know, committing a crime. Um, so that's what we were trying to get at. Now, if, if we didn't do that uh, sufficiently, um, we can certainly take a look at that language again. But um, our intent was to try to, again, allow for liability even when the minor, you know, um, uh, you know, again, didn't didn't do it, right? They were solicited, they were encouraged to, but they didn't do it. There wasn't any any anything more um, that would be sufficient. So we can try to clarify that in commentary, but I, I'm I'm not sure the our statutory language here in the revised statute is a problem, and we really tried to kind of echo that provision in the current law. I, I assumed that that was your intent. I, guess, uh -huh. I think you're more culpable if you're doing it to a six-year-old than maybe a eight-year-old, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. Depending on what it is, but um, yeah. Yeah, it does seem like maybe just clarifying this in the commentary and kind of clarifying that the developmental incapacity defense wouldn't bar a prosecution of an adult for this um, or, or something like that. Sure, we, we yeah. can we can do something particular to the developmental incapacity um, defense or you know, a foot, footnote example or something to kind of note that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, was there anything else then on this report? Otherwise, um, I would say let's kind of move on to the defenses. All right. Um, Hearing nothing, uh, let's move on to, I guess, 66 is the next. Um, and again, I realize, you know, there are multiple provisions in here. Uh, some of these obviously um, are relevant to legislation now before the council, um, the hearing next week um, in terms of uh, both law enforcement, but also some definitional issues. Um, so, you know, this is our first take at it, um, our first draft, and, uh, you know, very much appreciate um, any comments you all have, and we'll be, you know, watching, obviously, the, um, the hearing, kind of um, seeing how how this gets sorted out. The, the council hearing, though, is, is just, you know, be clear, much more kind of narrow and targeted, right, at, um, law enforcement use of deadly force. 
Um, and I don't think um, we certainly don't. We're trying to do a more kind of comprehensive approach here, obviously, to self-defense, defense of others by any person, let alone a law enforcement officer. And um, uh, so we are trying to fold in that aspect, um, but uh, going much broader as well. So um, again, it, maybe folks want to hold their questions, uh, <laughs> but um, if, if there's anything at this time on uh, report 66, um, let's let's discuss that now. All right. Um, last call for 66. If not, also bundle in 67 if there's um, uh, something in uh, the defenses in report 67 that uh, folks are uh, would like to discuss this morning. All right, um, not hearing anything. Um, uh, in that case, uh, we are then uh, through the agenda for this morning. Um, thank you all. Uh, our next meeting is gonna be, like I said, the day after the election, uh, Wednesday, November 4th, uh, our usual time, 10 a.m. And uh, I appreciate, you know, if you have questions in the interim, uh, do please, uh, send me an email, we can set up a time to talk about it, or if it's a discrete question, even better if you can put it um, in an email that gives us more of a time to like, kind of do any background research in order to respond. Um, but that's it, thank you all. Uh, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting for the day. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.